have your Bibles, we invite you to turn to Joshua 4. And we'll read verses 1 through 11. Joshua 4, 1 through 11. And it came to pass when all the people were clean and passed over Jordan that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man. And command ye them, said, Take ye hence out of the midst of the Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe and man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take you up every man of you as stone upon his shoulder according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you that where your children ask, when your children ask, their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did as Joshua commanded, and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan. As the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, and carried them over with them, and to the place where they lodged, and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the best of Jordan, in the place where the feet of the priests, which by the ark of the covenant stood, and they are there unto this day. For the priests, which by the ark, stood in the midst of the Jordan, every, until everything was finished, that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people, according to all that Moses commanded Joshua, and the people hasted and passed over. And it came to pass, when all the people were clean, passed over, that the ark of the Lord passed over, and the priests in the presence of the people. May God add his blessing to read of his words. One of the climactic events of all biblical history. The Israelites have waited 40 years. But now the time had come. It is a poignant moment as they stride across the river bed of the Jordan, open for them by the miraculous <coughs> power of God. Behind them they leave four weary and decades of meandering around in a wander and a barren wilderness. And the tragic memories of countless loved ones that they buried the whole generation there except Joshua and Caleb who will not trust God's promises. Slavery in Egypt and the bare survival of a nomadic life are bygone experiences now. A new and welcome chapter opened before them. Before them lay a land richer than their dreams more fruitful than their hopes, more beautiful than their imagination. Now it is theirs by God's steadfast promise. It must have felt very surreal to have entered Canaan, to finally stand in the promised land, sort of like if you have a new home and you go into it for the first time. You've envisioned it. You've planned for it. You've imagined what you'll do with it. But when you step through that front door, your emotions soar. This was the fulfillment of the ancient promise made to their father Abraham that he would give them the land, that he would make to their descendants as the stars of the sky, the sands of the sea. And finally, after many years coming up out of Egypt and 40 years, after 40 years of wandering, they finally come in to the land of Canaan. Their joy had been magnified by recent events, 
when they arrived at the Jordan, they found it at flood stage, menacing in its speed and dangerous for what it concealed. The jungle-like growth covered by the rapid current left Israel flat-footed. The river was impassable, its crossing impossible. But in a way, much like the Lord had intervened many years before when they were crossing the Red Sea, when they were making the exodus out of Egypt, God would do another miracle and He would part the flooded waters there of the Jordan. Here was His signature again in the same way to assure His people that He was good to His word. Can't you imagine the songs and the shouts and, and the praising uh, of God, of the people as they worship and exalted in Him? But there was also one important act that calls for our attention this morning. After Israel crossed, God gave Joshua some very specific instructions as we read there in verses 1 through 3. And after the Israel, the entire nation, had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua that he was, he was given the command to choose 12 men from the people, one man from each tribe of the nation of Israel, and he commanded them to take 12 stones from the place in the middle of the Jordan where the priest's feet are standing, to take them, to carry them with you, set them down at the place where you spend the night. Joshua did exactly uh, as he uh, was told. He selected 12 men uh, to the riverbed there they were to bring the stones there, heavy stones, mind you, and then they brought them and then they stacked and uh, put them up there on the land. Stones don't naturally stack very easily unless they're flat stones. I remember I've seen many a man in these mountains lay a rock, you've called it lay a rock before, and sometimes they don't match and you'd have to take your mason hammer and beat the face off of them until you did to make them work. But why? What is the meaning of these stones? Well, it said, God essentially says there in verse 7, tell them the story of how the waters of the Jordan were cut off in front of the ark of the Lord's covenant. And when it crossed the Jordan there, and, and then in verses 23 and 24, the Lord your God dried up the water <coughs> of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over, just as the Lord did at the Red Sea. The purpose in all this is that Israel would not forget the mighty hand of God that had brought them forth out of Egypt and had brought them across the Red Sea and now would be bringing them into the land. Now what's, what are some of the meanings of these memorial stones this morning? Well, I want us to look at a few. And first of all, we need to realize that it's all about God. Seeing that rock pile, learning the story, the people of Israel would know clearly that they had not crossed Jordan on their own. The stones cried out. God did this. By His head we have forded the river. By His power and faith we have accomplished this. Now this morning, uh, we're in the sites where it's just a girl Baptist church. And uh, most of us, well all of us, basically are home folk. And we remember those precious saints that have gone on before. I can't name them all or I miss somebody. I'm not going to try. You know who they are. But the tremendous sacrifices made, especially in this, 
This auditorium, I believe, was completed in uh, basically 1945. A lot of our men were over overseas fighting World War II. And uh, here, this is, I think this is Lacey's, this is about the fourth building, isn't it? That we've been in. I think there were two up and up or seven in them, one on up near the ridgeways, and this is the fourth one. But there was a tremendous amount of sacrifice, a lot of craftsmanship, a lot of people who volunteered uh, to build this church. Then later on, uh, a parsonage would be built. And uh, my point in saying this is that. This is a memorial this morning. But it was not built, I can safely say, in the hearts of, of the saints that have gone on before, in the hand and God's hand, uh, he, he uh, inspired them to put a church here. This was built for God. It wasn't built for us. It was not built to lift us up, to magnify us. And anything that we do for the Lord, any building that we build or any memorial that we erect or anything should be for the glory of God. Uh, the, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor over it in vain. Not by mine, or not by strength or might, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts in Zechariah 4, 6. Everything that we do, we must do for the glory of God. Now secondly, these stones are spiritual age or spiritual markers. You know, spiritual memory is crucial in the life of a Christian. Do you vividly remember the times that God spoke? And that's why it's important to, in some way, record those times. Either keep a journal or some mental note of them. Of those times that God has, has spoken to you. Now, it, it, wouldn't it be tragic if we did not have the spiritual markers to mark the crossroads of our lives? You know, without these markers... Uh, we would lose. I'll give you an example. Uh, I grew up in this church, Gloria and Greg were roughly the same age. And uh, we started downstairs in a little car place. My first two or three teachers was Helen and Virgie and Lucy Earp. Uh, and there, is where I got my start. I was brought to church from earliest remembrance. I was not asked if I wanted to come to church. But my mom and daddy broke me. Now sometimes, being a little boy, I'd get bored. And a lot of times, I'd get under the seats. <laughs> but I'm saying all this, this is a spiritual mark. This is where I had my beginning. And then many years, in fact, this is the 25th year of my ordination. I was ordained in this church, I believe, uh, February the 5th of 1992, I believe, if I remember correctly. <laughs> but we all have the spiritual markers, the times that when we were saved, the times that we grew up. And you know, Israel experienced a, tr a tumultuous pilgrimage. And they doubted God many times. They said, well, God has brought us out into this uh, strange and this foreign land and we're all going to die and we would have been better off to have went back to Egypt. <laughs> then God miraculously parted the waters there of the Jordan River so they could pass over and conquer the land. God knew that Israel would face many intimidating enemies. Uh, they had failed, as we saw last week in the book of Judges, they had failed to drive out the Canaanites. And they'd give them a lot of trouble 
uh, there through the years. And you know, they might be, they might think in times of discouragement that they might think, well, uh, we've made a big mistake by leaving Egypt and cutting into Cape. You know, sometimes when we get down and out in our Christian life, we will probably, we'll probably go back and say, did God tell me to do this? Is this really God's will? That's why we need those spiritual markers in our lives. And God wanted them to put up these memorial stones so they would remember. And also their children and their children's children would, would ask, well, what, what's, what mean, what is the meaning of that big stack? pile of stones there. Now often men in the Old Testament, uh, for example, Jacob would erect a marker or an altar as a reminder uh, of their, their encounters with God. Now, at Bethel, Brother Jacob, their forefather, had a wrestling match. Uh, now we, uh, if, if it's wrestling, we always refer to it as the professional wrestling, or wrestling, high school wrestling. But we used to call it wrestling. He had him a wrestling match with the angel of the Lord there. And he wouldn't let him go until he had blessed him. And he got his hip out of joint. He always had a limp. But uh, Jacob's place was Bethel, the house of God. And then Rehoboam there, the rule became a great spiritual uh, reminder. Moses named an altar, the encounters with God. The Lord is my battle. Samuel named a stone, Ebenezer said, thus far as the Lord helped us. You know, a spiritual marker identifies the time that you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I did, I believe in February 1978 when we were living up at the farm. A year or two later, I was baptized down in Crabtree Chapel. And then there are specific times. For instance, your calling, your, your vocation, when you needed God's help for you to make a decision. And then thirdly, we have a missionary purpose. Uh, Joshua told Israel that these stones would serve as a reminder that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord's hand is mighty, so that you may always fear the Lord your God. Now, a church should always have one mission, and that is the great commission. That is the preaching, the teaching of the gospel, and the support sending out of missionaries. Not to worship these people, um, uh, these buildings are nice. There are many fine church buildings across the land. But I'm afraid a lot of people, a lot of church people are worshiping those buildings. Should be doing that. We have a purpose. This is a memorial, but outside of that, uh, we have a job to do. And then, fourthly, we are spiritual stones. That car of stones of Gilgal should teach us that we are lively stones built up for a spiritual house to holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2 5. The priesthood of the believer, a hallmark belief of Baptist. We are priests to each other. And we do not need a priest to go to God. We can go directly uh, through the Holy of Holies all the way back to the throne room of God. We don't need a priest. We don't need a potentate in order to go to God. So we are uh, spiritual stones. The truest witness to Christ is to be found in the lives of his members, those who make him visible. To such the power will make a way for Israel through Jordan. God will not fail them. Promise will be fulfilled by the Savior. Now what does all this mean for Chestnut Grove? 
this morning. Well, in one sense, I would argue that our new Constitution bylaws are our are a landmark or a spiritual mark. It says who we are. We're a Bible believing, autonomous Baptist church. It states our beliefs, our policies, our stand against a culture that in many ways has forsaken God, enacting their own laws, thus you serve. Or 